it's it shows life for me yeah it shows for me as well that it's life okay so uh, hello everyone i'm glad to be back here with this audience okay. and it's live. Yep. yeah go for it it's live in that <laughs> go go, go. Uh, so it's nice to be back here with this audience and I'm gonna just, I prepared a short talk. It's actually the same slides that I used for my PhD Viva, just to give an overview of my research that I've done during my PhD. And my thesis was called Enabling Methods for Privacy Preserving Data Sharing in Genomics. So just a, a very brief overview. First, like what is genome sequencing? It's basically uh, figuring out the order of DNA nucleotides or bases in a genome. Uh, that make up an organism's DNA. And the human genome is made up of over 3 billion of these genetic letters. The more important question is why does it matter? It matters because it actually helps with the prevention, diagnosis, treatment, as well as understanding of rare diseases. And data sharing in genomics is paving the way towards personalized medicine and development of treatments for rare diseases. And moreover, we now have that uh, funding bodies have introduced requirements that data sharing must be a consideration for funding applications in genomics. And in order Sorry, to support- uh, yeah. Your slide is white. I don't know if that's a yes. part of it. <laughs> yes, I'll, I'm getting there. Oh, okay. <laughs> and in order uh, to support data sharing, there are many organizations that do this. I got there. Um, such as uh, the National Institute of Health, uh, as well as Genomics England, and also uh, the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. And in fact, they came up with several projects, uh, two, the most uh, notable two of them being the Beacon Project and the Matchmaker Exchange. And we're gonna, uh, during this talk, we're gonna uh, hear a bit more about the Matchmaker Exchange there. Uh, so even though um, the availability of genomic data is essential to progress in biomedical research, um, it's extremely sensitive, it makes it problematic if not outright impossible to publish or to share it. So that is because it contains information related to heritage, predisposition to diseases, as well as uh, phenotypic trait. And that makes it hard to anonymize as it's pre previously been shown. In fact, um, even uh, hiding sensitive information shared um, within, within shared genomes does not protect the individual. And it is not only sensitive for the individual, but also for their relatives. And even the release of aggregate data has been proven to be problematic multiple times in other attacks. And additionally, why genomic data is interesting is because the consequences of genomic data disclosure are not limited in time or to the data owner, as I just mentioned uh, that it's sensitive to the relatives as well. So uh, in my thesis, I aimed to uh, answer three main research questions, given the, these existing challenges, as well as opportunities related to genomics. So the broad call of, goal of the thesis um, is to evaluate existing methods proposed for genomic data sharing. And such a goal uh, entails several open research questions, such as how can we improve existing frameworks that aim to support genomic data sharing and encourage researchers to collaborate? Then. Uh, can we rely on existing encryption techniques for long-term encryption to enable sharing of encrypted genomic data? And finally, uh, is synthetic data a suitable alternative, both in terms of utility and privacy for enabling genomic data sharing? And uh, the contributions uh, that these uh, thesis will make, which I'll go through as we go along a bit more in detail, is first, we propose anonymity which is a framework that supports anonymous queries within the genomic data sharing platform, the Matchmaker Exchange, which was one of the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health projects, without breaking any of its current security se settings or functionality requirements. Then we analyze the only system proposed to date that aims to provide long-term security for genomic data, namely GenoGuard, and finally, we assess the suitability of synthetic data for enabling privacy preserving data sharing in genomics. So um, the, first, the first project is um, Anonymy. And uh, basically um, the matchmaker, uh, I'll present briefly the matchmaker exchange, which acts as a portal supporting simultaneous querying over multiple databases that are members of the exchange. 
And uh, more specifically, um, on the, match the matchmaker exchange allows the researchers to query a specific gene. Um, and if a match is found, then the researcher is notified of all matches within the database in the matchmaker exchange and can get, get in touch with the user that submitted um, that case on which a match is generated. Um, there are no current attacks implemented. However, the main issue is that whenever you try to query something, all queries will be revealed to all researchers who have queried the same gene on, or phenotype, which might lead to exposing some sensitive information or even to loss of privacy or competitive advantage. So for this purpose, uh, we propose Anonymity, which is essentially a framework for bringing anonymity to the matchmaker exchange. And um, Anonymity would support anonymous queries by relying on uh, reverse private information retrieval, while still mirroring all the functionality that the matchmaker exchange currently has. So um, users uh, can still query the platform, However, in this case, nobody will be able to tie user to the query. And uh, queries now um, will include the gene name as in the matchmaker, as before in the matchmaker exchange, but as well as the querying user's public key. And they will be collected during epochs whose length can be based on the number of write requests on a certain epoch. And um, now uh, users can have the opportunity to choose who they want to share the data with instead of just broadcasting the query and contact details to everybody who previously queried um, a similar gene. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, the queries, uh, we use our, as our main building block reverse uh, private information retrieval. And we extend queries to support public key encryption of contact details, as well as we add a response phase so that users will be able to anonymously reply to queries. And now uh, the main difference between anonymity and the match and MME, which is the matchmaker exchange, is that the queries are now split between multiple servers and collected in epochs based on the number of queries, and this uh, finally displayed at the end of an epoch. Um, so this this is the main uh, the main uh, uh, the main conclusion, like how anonymity would work, and it's basically a privacy overlay that would help uh, will help users uh, to actually uh, do anonymous queries on the platform. Now, um, we move on to talk a bit about longer term encryption. And as I mentioned before in the beginning of this talk is that consequences uh, of genomic data disclosure are not limited in time. And in fact, modern encryption algorithms provide security guarantees only against computationally bounded adversaries. Essentially, their security is assumed to last for um, 30 to 50 years. However, this is not the case. This is not the, a good case when it comes to genomic data. And uh, you might have known about the case of Henrietta Lacks, which is a patient who died of cancer in 1951. And some of her cancerous cells were revealed to be useful for research because of their ability to keep on dividing. And without uh, her family knowing, the cells became uh, the most commonly used immortal cell line, and their genome was in fact uh, published, uh, sequenced and then published. And actually this prompted serious privacy concerns among her family members even 60 years later. So even though this is a big problem, we only have up to date, we only have one piece of work that attempts to deal with this issue of long-term um, storage, encryption and storage for genomic sequences. And uh, it's namely GenoGuard, which uh, based their construction on Honey encryption. Uh, Honey encryption uh, provides gar uh, confidentiality guarantees in the presence of brute force attacks. And it uses as a main building block a uh, distribution transformer, a uh, transforming encoder, a DTE, which uh, has two, two functions, an encode function which takes a message and outputs a seed, and a decode function which takes a seed and outputs the message such that uh, whenever you decode the encoded message, it should give you back exactly the, uh, the message. Now, um, so basically, Honey Encryption and uh, GenoGuard as well um, are, are based on the fact that whenever uh, somebody tries to decrypt uh, a password using, uh, decrypt a uh, ciphertext using a wrong password, it will give a plausible looking uh, plain text. 
However, uh, GenoGuard provides only a message recovery and security guarantee. And we decide to provide an analysis of how much information the ciphertext might leak, as well as motivated by additional work uh, uh, by Jagger and all, we showed that uh, we showed that the impossibility of known message attack security in the case of low entropy keys for honey encryption, we actually adapted their attack in the context of side information for genomic sequences. So um, we we decided to evaluate the GenoGuard security by analyzing the ciphertext obtained using easily guessable low, uh, low entropy passwords as well as hard uh, high entropy passwords. And what we did in our evaluation is that given a user who wants to uh, encrypt their uh, genome using GenoGuard, they first encode it to obtain the seed using the DTE, and then they encrypt it to obtain a ciphertext. Now consider uh, an adversary that gets access to that uh, encrypted data. So for, for example, uh, they can break into the biobank or uh, the biobank itself can be adversary and as well as has access to some public knowledge. Now what um, the adversary will do is we're gonna try to decrypt that ciphertext uh, using multiple passwords. And in each case, they will obtain a plausible looking uh, genome sequence. Now, the question that we asked is how much information, if any, do those uh, honey sequences leak? And in fact, um, uh, we found in our results that in the case of low entropy password, it's very easy to discard the honey, uh, the number of honey sequence, the, plus, the number of possible honey sequences. Um, the, the, it's very uh, easy to discard uh, the incorrect sequences. And in fact, for the high entropy password, which, which is the more interesting case, interested case because you don't have a fixed pool of passwords, is that we found that with 5% or more side information, we were able to predict the rest of the sequence uh, with 10% more uh, accuracy than all other baseline inference methods that we considered that could have, um, could have predicted the rest of the sequence. And uh, in conclusion for this piece of work was that even though GenoGuard could be a viable solution, it can only be a viable solution when uh, the user incorporates all side information into their encryption. And since all side information will need to be stored together with the ciphertext, the user must also consider that even the ba baseline methods can predict with high accuracy most of the correct sequence, as well as um, the fact that the research community should invest more resources towards the design of long-term encryption tools for genomic data. And finally, we get to the last part of this talk, uh, which is, uh, where we're looking at uh, utility uh, and privacy evaluation of synthetic data. And to begin with, we'll just look at the utility of gener uh, generative models in general. So, and why do we do this? Is basically, we looked at GenoGuard, which aimed at protecting the genomic data by using decoy sequences. Now, we know that generative models uh, give us synthetic data. So why not um, look at those and evaluate their performance in generating synthetic data sets like from both utility and privacy perspective. So this first piece of work was done as an internship at the Turing Institute. And for this project, we evaluated four generative models on four types of data sets under three types of tasks. And overall, from an utility perspective, we concluded that there is no such thing as one fits all model. And even if the model uh, if the, ta if the model, the classifier model would perform best on the original data, privacy might still be needed or mandated for certain cases. And privacy preserving synthetic data offers a better alternative for guaranteeing privacy for the users than approaches such anonymization or data aggregation. However, and, and also uh, research prototypes uh, offer promising results, but only in specific setting and you can't just use out of the box all the time. Each model you need, need to be needs to be evaluated before usage with respect to the needed scenario. And now for the more interesting part, which is uh, part of a project uh, joint, which was joint work with Teresa and Carmela for, from EPFL. Uh, we propose, a, uh, we do a privacy evaluation of generative models. And for this uh, purpose, we implement a membership inference attack on uh, generative models. 
And for this, we use uh, the shadow modeling techniques, which was introduced initially by Shokri and all, to implement our adversary. And how we do this is we are giving a reference data set, um, which we use it and split it into n subsamples. Now, on each, um, uh, on each of these, uh, uh, for each of these other samples, we get we uh, we have one where it doesn't have a target, and then for the other, we add the target in. Now, uh, for each for each of the data sets, both with and without the target, we train uh, we train a set of shadow models from which we sample synthetic multiple uh, a set of synthetic data sets. Now, each data set will get a label according to uh, whether the target was or not in the training data sets. And now we do this for all our, our sampled um, data sets. And uh, we use this to train a classifier, a membership inference classifier, that uh, when it would be given a synthetic data set, we'll be able to predict whether the target was um, used in generating that data set or not. And for this reason, we introduced the notion of privacy gain for a generative model. And under the assumption of uh, equal prior 0 0.5, which is the case for um, uh, which is the case for the baseline for membership inference and uh, perfect linkage in the case of the raw data set, we we compute the privacy gain for multiple data sets. And uh, where we have that a, a privacy gain of zero means that publishing the synthetic data set is equivalent to publishing the real data set. A privacy gain of 0 0.25 gives the adversary no advantage over random guessing. And finally, uh, when the privacy gain is greater than is uh, 0 0.5, which is the maximum value, means that the publishing S significantly, significantly reduces the adversary's chance of success. And our main findings, uh, for this was that while some records uh, received good protection from uh, synthetic data publishing, others remained vulnerable to linkage attacks. And it is not possible to predict privacy gain for a particular target without fixing the entire training set. We also found a, a high variance in the average privacy gain across target records, in, which would indicate that the model tends to amplify the signal for some of the records in the training set, while it actually hides the presence of others meaning that it gives uh, the separate protection. And finally, we apply all of, all of the previous to uh, genomic data. And for this reason, we uh, chosen, um, analyzed four generative models purposely built for genomic data, as well as introduce and evaluate two new ones to help overcome the issues of the low number of samples. And uh, we chose three genomic data sets for evaluation. I have a typo there, I'm sorry. And finally, we evaluate utility uh, in terms of common summary statistics for genomic sequences, as well as vis-a-vis um, uh, uh, -vis the membership inference attacks. We also introduced a new membership inference attack where um, the attacker has partial only partial information of available about the target sequence. And in this case, our main finding was that even with the purposely built models, there is still no model that outperforms all the others in terms of both utility and privacy. Uh, we found that the size of the training set is, um, matters, especially in the case of non-statistical models. And using the hy hy some hybrid models to boost the number of training samples actually helps with the utility. However, the worrying part, is, which we found is that even with partial information from the target sequence available to the attacker, targets are still at the risk of membership inference. And to conclude, um, we found that high quality synthetic data must accurately capture the relations between data points. However, this can also enable attackers to infer sensitive information about the training data used to generate uh, the synthetic data set. So uh, a brief conclusion. In this work, um, in my thesis, we evaluated methods proposed for enabling genomic data sharing. Uh, first of all, we provide an anonymity framework to enable anonymous data sharing with the Matchmaker Exchange platform. Then we highlight potential risks that might arise from using the only available tool for long-term encryption of genomic data. And finally, we perform a measurement study to assess the 
suitability of uh, generating synthetic data for genomic data application. One more slide, last but not least, one of the most notable uh, achievements uh, after I finished, it came after actually after I finished this PhD, and this is it. Having this message from my supervisor saying, I have nothing left to teach you, it is a good achievement. Um, so I, I meant about LaTeX. Huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking it and running away with it. <laughs> so um, I, mean, I meant overall, yes, but <laughs> it was triggered by LaTeX comment. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, last, uh, I want to thank all, I want to thank all my collaborators for uh, working with me and bearing with me. And I hope they enjoyed working with me as much as I did working with them. Um, thank you. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Really great. <laughs> Questions? For Questions, yes. But anyway, I wanted to say like Riz has been very humble, but you know, she graduated with this, this work as she was published in places like Usenix, NDSS, uh, ISMB, which is a top bioinformatics conference. Um, so very, very good stuff. And uh, overall, it's been a really great pleasure to, to work with you, Briz, both as a you know, researcher as a, and as a person, it's, uh, which is um, always a very uh, rare combination <laughs> you know, to have. Uh, it's been it's been a really a lot of fun, um, and Thank I'm you. glad that you're staying around in London, so uh, we we can continue seeing you and having you in our uh, you know group events and so on. Um, especially because you bring Leia to the dog, so <laughs> <laughs> it's Leia's, not me. <laughs> anyway, qu uh, questions. Yeah, just wanted to quickly say uh, it's not that much of a question, uh, but yeah, like really thanks, Bruce. It was you know amazing to you know write this paper you know with you under your guidance. Like you, you've been like super patient, yeah, super knowledgeable. Uh, and yeah, I wanted to just you know thank you once again. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Excuse me. Thank you. Hello. Hi. I have one simple question. Uh, yes. Thanks, uh, Bruce, Anna, for your talk. As you know, there are different approaches for achieving PIR functionality, such as using crypto coding and even hashing structures. What was your main priority and kind of consideration to use this building block in your work on the anonymity? reverse private? You're referring to the reverse private information retrieval, right? Yes. yes. It was. Uh, it was at the time when we wrote the paper. It seemed like the most suitable. Uh, building block for the use case that we needed uh, for the specific uh, data sharing use case that we needed at the time, because we wanted to have something where users can still query as they did before, but also have the option to like see those the queries like they make their queries public, but they they get a response they get a response in private, which is a bit different than how it was like broadcasting to everyone and revealing my identity as well when I'm broadcasting something to everyone. So we used the reverse PIR because it gave us the opportunity as well to know where your message was, how to get it back, and also uh, to bring in the response phase. Yes, actually my question is there are different approaches to achieving a PIR functionality using, for example, cryptography, coding theory. Yes. What, uh, what was your approach in, in uh, uh, constructing this PIR and using this PIR in your work. For example, uh, you might- Are you talking uh, about distributed point, point functions or- Not exactly, but maybe uh, some uh, people uh, uh, mostly care about efficiency. Some other care about privacy. But uh, uh, I just wanted to know whether uh, you were, uh, you uh, considered uh, mostly efficiency side of the protocol. No, and mostly the privacy side of the yeah. protocol. Yeah. Because efficiency, like if you don't, if you just want efficiency, you don't really need a privacy overlay. If you just want everything to be fast and work, if you're not worried about privacy, there's no point in actually putting the privacy overlay, right? Yes. Because the best efficiency is just do it everything as it was before. Thank you. No, no problem. I also had a question. 
Um, for starts, uh, thank you for, for the talk. I really enjoyed it. And I wanted to ask with respect to long-term genomic data storage. So th the solution, uh, the state of the art did, does not offer much security, if I understand correctly. So uh, is, it, but it, yeah, 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 sorry. Uh, is there hope for it or are there like impossibility results that so this is this is a bit of an arms uh, arms race kind of question because at the same time there's also the issue that genomic sequencing is becoming much cheaper so at some point it might be cheaper to just like find the strand of hair of your target and get that data <laughs> and at that point you have no no reason to have like the long term like it does it defeats the purpose of having the long term storage but like it's still like up to date, there's nothing else that's been proposed that has better efficiencies. And again, that's because if we uh, use the, the current encryption methods that exist, they only, they're only made to work for 30 to 50 years, maybe quantum. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, very, very satisfying response. Like if you can just follow the target and take care of her, that's, <laughs> you have lost. Okay, thank you. <laughs> But yeah, if there are no other questions, I'm gonna let Anya talk about her talk, uh, about her work. Yeah, okay, so let me try to share my screen. Let's see how it's gonna work. How about that? Can you see it, guys? Yeah, okay. So hi, everyone. My name is Anya Petrovska. I actually see a lot of new faces, which, uh, means I didn't have a chance to meet a, a, a many of you. So I currently work at NIM Technologies and I, uh, I had my PhD defense in August 2020, which now feels a bit like ages ago and a lot happened uh, since then. So I thought that I will combine kind of in this talk a bit about my PhD studies and um, about my current work at NIM because they're very cro closely connected with each other. So just to give you a little bit of a background and motivation. So during my PhD, I worked on privacy enhancing technologies with a very strong focus on anonymous communication. So in case you're not familiar with anonymous communication, what it means is that we look at the network layer um, and we would like to ensure that people can communicate in a way which cannot allow linking users with their online activities. So every time you do something over the internet, you leave kind of like a digital footprint. And it doesn't really matter if you're using encryption or if you're trying to use more like privacy preserving crypto coins, the network layer and the metadata which is being um, exhibited on this network layer allows to uniquely identify the users and allows to link the users with their online activities. So it kind of almost undermines any privacy protections which encryption or ZK proofs can give you. So this metadata includes information like who is communicating with whom, how often, in which location, what is the dynamic of the communication. And I once read somewhere a very nice sentence that metadata is really everything but the content of the communication. So anything um, regarding your, your you know, network footprint can be used uh, in order to kind of create like a profile of a user and try to you know, infer some sensitive information about them. So um, there are currently um, a few solutions and technologies which you can use to kind of give yourself a bit of a boost in your online privacy on, or anonymity, if you want to name it like that. So the most popular ones are VPNs. Um, so in, in case of VPNs, you have a centralized proxy and you kind of use the, the IP address of the VPN when you're connecting to an open web or some services. So uh, your communication is going into the VPN proxy and then the VPN proxy is forwarding it. Then a uh, recently quite popular scheme are the decentralized VPN. So if you ever heard about ORCID, for example, this is a decentralized VPN. So in a decentralized VPN, the users 
also act as VPN proxies to some extent. So each user offers a, a fraction of its bandwidth um, to forward other users' traffic. And then, of course, the most popular anonymous communication network is Tor. So Tor is a decentralized network. Um, it's a network uh, which is built as a client server architecture, which means we have the end users and we also have dedicated um, Tor relays, which are forwarding the traffic. We have the entry guard, the middle relays, and the exit nodes. And the traffic is forwarded through circuits. So once you open your Tor browser and you establish you know, your session for 10 minutes, you'll be using the same circle, which is composed of three uh, Tor relays, one entry node, one middle node, and one exit relay. And your traffic is being layer encrypted and is forwarded through the circuit and then the exit node is forwarding it into the open web. However, all those designs have some issues. So um, the problems of VPN, obviously the first one is that it's centralized. So you're not really anonymous vis-a-vis -vis the VPN provider because the VPN provider can tell exactly which website you're accessing. Um, and then, you know, there are these big questions about what if they can log all of your activities and then reveal them to you know um, some third party uh, companies or maybe some governmental authorities and so on. Um, the second problem is that if you're gonna look here at the, um, at the scheme of uh, VPN, VPNs do not provide you any traffic analysis resistance. It means that if we have an adversary who can observe the connection between the user and the VPN node, and then the connection between the VPN node and the open web or some service, he will be able to correlate um, your communication based on the timing and the size of the packets, because there's nothing obfuscating that. And of course, there are a lot of VPNs which kind of offer you uh, a free of charge service, which probably you shouldn't use because nothing in the world is for free. So if you're not paying in cash, you're probably paying in some other way, for example, with your privacy. So they might install some third party trackers in their software in order to track your online activities and so on. The decentralized VPNs um, solve a little bit of the you know, uh, problems of uh, traditional VPNs, for example, by having a decentralized architecture, but they are still vulnerable to traffic analysis attacks and they don't really propose um, any significant solutions which uh, could overcome this. So Tor is definitely the best anonymous communication tool you can use um, right now. It's around for a very, very long time. It's really highly developed, but it also has some limitations. So Tor was, um, the way Tor was designed was to prevent users privacy or anonymity against local adversaries. So a local adversary is an adversary who can control or observe only a small part of the network. So an example would be your ISP provider or a network eavesdropper who only looks at the connection between uh, the Tor browser and the, and the guard node, or an adversary who can only eavesdrop on a few links in the network. Uh, and because of that, it means that Tor is not also resistant against traffic analysis attacks like end-to-end -end correlation attacks. So the attacks in which the adversary can look at uh, the, the link between the uh, Tor browser and the guard node, and then the link between the exit node and the open uh, web server. Uh, as it turns out, the, the Tor architecture is actually not even a, a resistant against website fingerprinting, which is quite bad because website fingerprinting is a type of an attack in which the adversary just sits between the Tor browser and the guard node on the entry node and is just observing passively the traffic flowing and is trying to infer which websites um, a user is accessing. And actually, there's a big, big line of studies which show that Tor does not prevent this type of attacks. And then, of course, if we're going to consider a global passive adversary, so an adversary who can observe the entire network and can, you know, count all the packets which are being sent, look at their timing, uh, look at the, you know, flow uh, of the stream of the packets, he will be able to very easily de-anonymize the Tor users. And then on top of that, we have a couple of smaller issues, let's call them like that. So first of all, Tor is 
um, run in a fully volunteer way. So everyone who wants to, every node in the Tor network is run by volunteers. They don't get any incentives or any rewards for their work. And in result, what is happening that is that very often some of the Tor nodes are not very well maintained. And uh, then the third issue is that Tor relies, it, although it's a decentralized network, it relies on semi-centralized components. So the directory authorities in Tor, which um, are kind of responsible for managing the view of the network and distributing it to them, uh, end users and also performing some measurements within the network are actually, I think like nine or 10 hard coded directory and authorities in them in the Tor software. And of course, the last issue is that if you're running the exit node in Tor, you might face repercussions because if someone is trying to forward some illegal type of traffic or make some illegal connection to um, porn website and so on, you're going to be responsible because from the perspective of the network observer, it's your node which is accessing this type of websites. So it's also very hard to actually be an exit node in Tor. So to kind of tackle those problems which Tor and VPNs have, we have mixed networks. So what is a mixed network? And, and mixed networks were the topic on which I was mostly focusing throughout my PhD. A mixed network is a, a decentralized network of cryptographic relays, which has which have one goal, to hide the correspondence between the senders and the recipients. So the goal of a mixed network is to make all the communication unlinkable. So we cannot tell who's communicating with whom. And mixed networks were introduced by David Chom in 1981. So they're actually much older than Tor is. And how do mixed networks achieve those properties? So they combine three uh, features. First, first of all, it's similarly as in case of Tor, it's a multi-hop network in which we have a bunch of distributed nodes and the traffic is routed by a multiple nodes in the network. The second feature is that we, again, layer encrypt the packets, which means that we cannot trace the packets based on their binary representation within the network. So if I'm the adversary and I'm observing the network, if I see some packet coming into the network, based on its binary pattern, I cannot tell where this packet is going within this network or after when it exits. And the third very, very important uh, property, and this is something that differentiates mixed networks from Tor or peer-to-peer uh, -peer anonymous communication networks like crowds and so on, is that mixed networks mix the packets. So you now know from where the name comes. So it means that instead of at each mix node, instead of forwarding at the first in, first out basis, the packets, it kind of performs some random shuffling permutation. So it changes thanks to that uh, the timing of the packet. So you cannot link and now the packets based on the timing analysis. So if you observe packet A coming first into the mix node, and then you observe you know, 20 other packets coming in, once the packets are going out, you cannot tell that you know the first one going out is the packet A you observe coming in as first, because you know that the shuffling operation just changed the ordering. So here is a little um, example of uh, how mixed network gonna work. So the mixed network proposed by David Chan was very simple. It was it had a cascade topology. A cascade topology means that there is just a long chain of mixed nodes, and the packets are layer encrypted. So we encrypt them in reverse order. Uh, David Chan was using the public key cryptography to encrypt them, and we inject the packets into the mix network. And then uh, I've mentioned the secure permutation. So how it was working for uh, in David Chalm's design is that uh, they use something called the batch and reorder technique. You can think about this as like shuffling a, a deck of cards. So when the mix node was receiving packets, it was actually collecting packets up to a certain threshold, let's say 100 packets. And only once the mix node received 100 packets, then when this is when it was shuffling them, so reordering them in some specific, um, following some specific kind of permutation, and then flashing them to the next um, mix node in the chain. 
So what it gave us is that we're changing the binary representation of the packets. We are changing their timing so they cannot be correlated based neither or you know, the binary representation or the timing. The global passive adversary, so even if we have an adversary uh, who can see the entire cascade of mix nodes, cannot link the packets which are coming into the mix network and going out. So the communication is unlinkable. And as long as at least one mix node in the cascade is honest, um, David Chan claimed that all the you know um, anonymity properties of the mix network stand. So even if the entry and exit mix node were malicious, as long as the middle one was honest, your communication is still unlinkable. So you could ask, if that's the case, why don't we have a mix network running? Why do we have Tor? Why do we have VPNs? And why we don't really have any mix network deployed and you know gaining popularity as Tor did? So the problem was that the design proposed by David Chaum had several key limitations. So as you probably can um, see by now, the fixed cascade topology, so the topology in which the mix nodes are all chained to the, together, scales very poorly because once a mix node reaches its capacity, you have no other way of improving the overall capacity of the network uh, rather than just turning off your mix nodes, replacing them with more powerful machines, and then restarting everything. The second problem was that the public key cryptography used for um, lay encrypting, the packets was very time consuming. And this combined together with the batch and reorder um, mixing technique was introducing very high end-to-end -end latencies for the communication. Because if there is a small traffic within the network, the mix node has to wait a very long time till it's gonna gather a hundred packets. And then if you have three or five mix nodes in the chain, it just extends the waiting time. Uh, and then if there's a lot of traffic within the network, still you're going only in batches of hundred. So when you have scalability problems, you're just gonna ultimately end up with very high latency overheads. And also the end users have no control on how long it will take for their packets to be delivered to the destination, right? Because you cannot predict in which batch your packet will be included. So because of that, the, the Chaumian mix set was very limited in terms of to which use cases it could be applied. It could potentially be good for emails if you're fine waiting potentially a week for your email to arrive. But in general, they prom promise very strong privacy properties, but at the cost of very poor performance. So one of the research questions which I had during my PhD was, can we design a mixed network which, is, which has the same security properties, but at the same time, it's much more uh, performance efficient and which could potentially be used for many more use cases like cryptocurrencies, for example, or instant messaging. So the use cases which are more you know, latency sensitive. And here comes uh, one of the contributions of my PhD, which is the Lupix anonymity system. So it's kind of like a novel mixed network design. So um, when you think about building anonymous communication network, the three basic uh, building blocks which you're gonna consider in terms of mixed networks is the network topology, the packet format, and the mixing technique. <laughs> so in Lupix, we opted for the stratified topology. A stratified topology is a topology in which you have a set of mixed nodes and they're grouped into layers, and then layers are connected one after another. So uh, the mixed node in the, let's say, this mix node in the second layer is connected with each mix node in the first layer and each mix node in the third layer, but there's no connection within the layer. And the traffic is always flowing from first to the last layer. So uh, in Lopix, we suggested that each packet should be sent by an independent path. And this path is being selected by the end user uh, by simply picking one random mix node from each layer. So in that case, if we're gonna want to, want to send one packet, we're gonna pick this mix node from first layer, this from second layer, and that one from the third one. And for next packet, we're gonna pick a completely different independent path. So you avoid having this long lived circuits and you avoid having the problem, you're avoiding having to face the problem of stream correlation. 
And why did we pick the stratified topology and not, for example, like a peer-to-peer -to -peer topology? Well, stratified topology scales very well because if your network runs out of capacity, you can increase the overall capacity of the network by simply adding more mix nodes in each layer, right? So you're just gonna expand each layer in order to reach the capacity which you need in case the user base is increasing. But in contrast to peer-to-peer -peer networks, which also scale very nicely, because stratified topology is a client and server architecture and you have those interconnections between different layers, the packets get very nicely mixed. You kind of don't have this problem that in peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, the, the network is just gonna boom and the traffic on each link will be very thin. So it's gonna give you very poor anonymity. No, instead you kind of gonna nicely mix the packets together and keep both the scalability and strong anonymity. So for the packet format, uh, we've picked the Sphinx design. If some of you are familiar with the Lightning Network, for example, the Lightning Network is using the Sphinx packet format. It's a very nice packet format, which offers you lane encryption and comes with uh, the bitwise unlinkability property and constant size of the packet. So the basic thing which you would like to have in anonymous communication network. But in addition to that, it uh, provides you uh, integrity checks, which means you're avoiding tagging on replay attacks. It allows you um, with a very small um, size overhead to encapsulate all the routing information within the packet. By routing information, I mean um, all the data or information or, or guidance which you as the sender would like to pass to the intermediate mix nodes which will be forwarding your traffic. So you can think about this as kind of like passing a, a secret instruction to each mix node which you picked for your packet. And only this mix node will learn that information. And then in addition to those uh, security features, Sphinx is very efficient. So we actually have the REST implementation now, which we use at them. And you can see that we're talking in terms of like milliseconds for, for packet creation and processing, which is very important. And, and the key change in Lupix over the Chow Mixnet was the mixing strategy. So you remember that I've mentioned that the Chowmian Mixnet was using this batch and reorder mixing techniques, which is just like shuffling a deck of cards. At Loop, in Lupix, we opted for the continuous time mixing technique. It means that uh, in this technique, when a mix node receives a packet, this packet is being delayed individually and independently from the other packets, the delay of how long a mix node should keep a packet is decided by the end sender. So if I want to send a packet, once I'm gonna pick my path for each mix node in the path, I'm gonna pick a random delay and put it inside this routing information within the Sphinx packet format. And this delay is being picked from the exponential distribution. So why do we do that? Um, for three reasons. So first of all, because the end, um, end users are picking the delays of how long a packet should be kept at each mix node, they have control over how long it will take for the packets to be delivered to the recipients. So this kind of allows them to tune up and down the delays, the, the parameter of the exponential distribution, and in result, the delays, which will be randomly selected based on which application they want to use. And uh, you can ask how the length is related to anonymity, like how this mixes anything at all. So exponential distribution has the so-called memoryless property. It's like a mathematical property, which you can think about this as the fact that the past has no bearing on the future. So if you play on a lottery and you played a thousand times and you've lost and you're like, oh my God, the next time I'm gonna win, I've lost so many times I have to win. That's not true. Like the next time you're gonna play, your chances of winning will be exactly the same. And that's where the memory less property comes. So in terms of a mix network, what is happening is that if the adversary observes a mix node and he sees a hundred packets coming in, and then he sees 50 packets coming in and then 10, he knows that right now there are 160 packets within the mix node. And because of this memory, memory less property, when he's gonna observe a packet living, this packet with equal probability can be any of the packets he just observed um, coming into the mix. So he cannot really tell anything about 
which packet is leaving the mix node based on the arrival times of the packets which you observed. And this is a very important property because theoretically, and I'm going to highlight here theoretically, if you consider a mix node, any of the packets which you ever observe entering this mix node can be still sitting there inside and can be still the next one to, to go out. So when you think about anonymity and you measure entropy, for example, Shannon entropy, uh, you have to consider all the history of the mix network when you're um, calculating anonymity. So that's very important because in the Chaumian mixnet, your anonymity was only as big as the threshold of packets which you were willing to collect. So if it was 100, your anonymity was just 100 other packets. So here, those two graphs summarize a bit what is the contribution of the Lupix mixnet over the Chaumian mixnet. So while in the Chaumian mixnet, you had a constant anonymity, exactly limited to the size of your batch, you are paying very quickly with a very high latency overhead. Lupix gives you the opposite. You can keep a very low latency overhead, and at the same time, when the number of users is increasing, your anonymity is just growing exponentially. So because of those features and the way uh, Lupix was designed, we found out that it actually can be used for various use cases. So we have the obvious use case, which is emails and instant messaging. And actually, when I was doing my PhD at UCL, we collaborated on the Katzenpus project, which was the EU-funded project to build, to kind of deploy the first mixed network, and it was Lupix, uh, which can be uh, used for emails and instant messaging. You can use it for cryptocurrencies as a building block. So if you would like to add uh, network player anonymity to Zcash or any other cryptocurrency, you can use a Lupix mix network. It can be used for file sharing. It can be used as a building uh, block for private notifications or broadcast systems and so on. So the, 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 the features that it scales and it also can be tuned up and down in terms of the latency, which, which you will be adding for mixing the packets, allows you to simply adjust the, the Lupix mix net depending on which um, which use case you are considering. But Lupix had one more, another feature. So everything what I told you so far is what is happening within the mix network. However, if you're gonna um, look a little bit into the research regarding anonymous communications, you're gonna see that there is um, a line of very specific attacks, which kind of discard what the anonymity system gives you. They focus on the edges of the anonymity network. So here we're talking about the traffic confirmation attack. So let's say that we have an adversary who can observe the links between um, the users and the entrance into the mix network, and then can observe the links between the exit mix nodes and the end users or services. So you can see here that even if you're gonna obfuscate the size of um, your packets and you're gonna obfuscate the timing of your packets, the fact that your behavior um, is, is very different than behavior of other people can actually allow the adversary, the adversary to trace your communication. So here it's kind of obvious that because Alice seems to be the one communicating very heavily and she has this burst of communication and at the same time Bob is receiving a burst of packets with very high probability they two are communicating. So to overcome this issue, what we propose in Lupix is the so-called loop cover packets. Uh, that's why it's called actually Lupix. So loop cover packets are dummy packets, which means uh, they don't carry any significant payload, but they are indistinguishable from genuine packets. So the ones which you actually use to, to exchange information. And in Lupix, the Lupix client sends all the traffic following the Poisson process, which means that there is a process running in the background of your, of your Lupix client. And if there is a real packet to be sent because Alice wants to communicate right now, we're gonna send this real packet following the Poisson process. However, if there is no real packet, what we're gonna do, we're gonna, instead of that, send a loop cover packet. So a dummy packet, we're just gonna go through the mix network and come back to you. In the result, what is happening is that we are hiding the patterns of communication of individual users. So we allow to obfuscate their um, unique behaviors and kind of make them all look in a very similar way. So the adversary cannot 
first of all, the, the traffic confirmation attacks will fail because you cannot really in any significant way try to correlate who's communicating with whom. And also we give the unobservability property, which means the adversary cannot tell whether someone is actually communicating or is just pretending to communicate. So this is like a, a scheme which shows a comparison between uh, VPN Tor and the Lupix Mix network. Uh, and it really summarizes everything what I just said. So while in VPN and Tor, uh, despite you know, their efforts to anonymize the traffic, you can uh, correlate the packets based on their size and, and timing, and at the end, figure out where the users are communicating to. And Lupix, you cannot really do that because the, the packets are fully anonymized. So Lupix was actually adopted by NIM. So NIM is a company which is building um, an incentivized privacy enhancing infrastructure or like the entire e ecosystem uh, to support various privacy oriented applications and services. And they have a couple of building blocks. One of them is the mix network and it's actually Lupix. And uh, we added actually for the mixnet, the Lupix mixnet at NIM, incentives and proof of mixing. So just to give you a bit of a uh, short mentioning, um, as I mentioned, Tor is fully volunteer. So you're not gaining any rewards uh, if you're running a Tor relay. If you're running a NIM mixnet, you will be rewarded for your work. So we call it kind of a proof of mixing. And the idea is that uh, because we're gonna have a blockchain and the NIM token, you as the end user or whoever else can delegate their tokens on a particular mix nodes they trust. And this is kind of acting like a reputation score. So now there is this uh, very nice uh, chain of events. If you're an honest mix node and you are performing a good job, you will be rewarded. Um, and that's where the proof of mixing will be coming. You will be rewarded. If you will be rewarded, you will be able to distribute rewards to your stakeholders and they will be happy and they will keep their stake on you or encourage other people to bring more stake. However, if you're being a malicious mix node or you're just being a very poor mix node, which is up and down all the time, you won't be gaining rewards. If you won't be gaining rewards, you won't be distributing them to your stakeholders. And this will, um, uh, this will result in you being removed from the active set of mix nodes because what we want to do, and this is something what Lupix didn't have and we're extending it at NIM, is kind of to have a way to kick out bad nodes from them, uh, from the mix network. So I, during my PhD, I worked on the Miranda design, which was kind of this baseline design, how can we spot malicious or poor performing mix nodes and remove them from the network. And what we do right now with the proof of mixing is kind of like Miranda plus plus, just a bit better. And the last thing which I wanted to mention is that um, the Lupix mixnet is just a small part. Uh, it's like a, one of the components in the name ecosystem. The second component are the anonymous credentials, because if you're going to think about that, the mix network gives you like a layer, a network layer protection. But then let's say you're using the name mixnet to go to a service, to access a service which requires a membership, right? If you're gonna show your membership and it's gonna tell, you know, this is Bob, whatever, you kind of undermine what you just achieved with the mix network because you're revealing your identity. So that's where the anonymous credentials uh, come. Anonymous credentials, for those of you who don't know them, are a cryptographic scheme which allows you to prove certain claims about yourselves. And it gives you control which type of uh, attributes about yourself you would like to expose, which ones you would like to share with someone else and with whom, and which ones you want to keep private. So it allows you to prove your right to access a certain service uh, by combining um, signatures and zero knowledge proofs without really uh, revealing your identity or undermining your privacy. And together it builds like this very generic, uh, very generic uh, platform in which we can plug different applications and services which would like to give some additional privacy boost for the users. So I am seven minutes late, but hopefully no one is sleeping yet. So if you have any questions, feel free. And then if you want to read more about NIM, we have all the bunch of resources starting from the um, website up 
until the uh, open source GitHub repo. Really great, thank you, Anya. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah, I can hear you, yeah. Very, really, really, really great. And uh, um, like similar to Brisella, you know, Anya has been uh, really, really uh, uh, humble, not not to mention also, you know, the uh, you know the, the fact that her publications were, uh, first of all, appearing in uh, uh, really great places like, you know, Usenix, uh, um, security. Um, I think you, you had a couple of, of yeah. Usenix um, and, and, and more, but also, you know, really Lupix uh, is something that we are now teaching uh, <laughs> in privacy classes, right? Nice. So, uh, yeah, so it's uh, it, it's quite interesting, you know, like um, we, we started teaching, you know, mixed networks, uh, you know, David Charles things and, you know, mixed networks, approximately half my age right so, you know 81 82 i was born 82 so you know now it's a new generation coming yeah. up, you know? <laughs> yeah. it's really it. so uh and, and you see it really is the state of the art now um so really uh it was great to have you uh at ucl Lania, and uh again well, uh, you know, i really believe it's all thanks to ucl you know ucl just has this good <laughs> vibe which makes you work hard and have good ideas. So it's all thanks to UCL. Uh, yeah, especially like the amazing coffee. Exactly, you, uh, es especially that coffee. I mean. uh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so uh, are there any questions? Uh, I saw um, Alex popped one in the chat. Is there a concern that this will be pointless for malicious nodes that are run by state adversaries, for example? Uh, I'm not sure whether I understand. I mean, the whole point of having economic incentives is to allow the, the people who are using the network to kind of decide on the reputation score of the mix nodes. So then, you know, by that you will be able to kick out the bad nodes, the ones which are misbehaving, right? So if you have a malicious node, which is actively misbehaving or underperforming, you will just kick him out because he will have a very low reputation score. Now, in case Alex is asking, so what could happen is that a state adversary is trying to run a mix node um, and it's not actually behaving in a malicious way. So he's like, you know, a dishonest node or like a node run by a bad guy, but is acting in a completely honest way. So it's going doing actually a very, very good job. So with that, the economic incentive doesn't really help, right? Because the node is running properly, it will be rewarded. However, if you're running, you know, a couple of mix nodes in the network, the thing which I've mentioned is that for the path which I pick to route my traffic, as long as at least one mix node is honest, then my communication is still unlinkable. So what would have to happen is that the such state adversary would have to control a very large percentage of the mix nodes in the network uh, just to increase the probability that when I pick a random path, I'm gonna pick all three nodes belonging to him because then we call it a fully malicious path and of course, a fully malicious path can trace my packets. I don't have with me the numbers, but we did some estimations some time ago, how many uh, mix nodes an adversary would have to really control to have any significant probability. And it was actually a very large number. So assuming that you know the mix network is open and anyone can run the mix node, we very strongly believe that also the social economics will make it very hard for the adversary to control really like a big fraction of the nodes. You're welcome. <laughs> any other any other questions? Maybe a short one. Uh, is there any chance that Mixnet can be used for interactive web browsing? Yeah, so this is a, a very, very good question. I kind of hope that it will pop. So um, we, we don't have web browsing as 
the most like top use case for now. We are mostly focusing right now on messaging and file sharing and cryptocurrencies. However, we do work, uh, we do work a little bit at NIM on the question of having using NIM mixnet for web browsing. So even though we use like you know a very fast packet format and the delays uh, for mixing can be really tuned down it's still too slow for web browsing right now so what we are doing is we're we're investigating um a completely new packet format which would be like five to ten times faster than the sphinx packet format and then we're thinking about having maybe kind of like two layer things so you have the mix network running and then on top of that you'll kind of have like a we refer to it internally as a fast mode mix network, which will allow for web browsing, but will have a bit smaller privacy properties because it will still be able to resist a global passive adversary, but it will be uh, it will be designed in a way which leaks some information to the intermediate mix nodes. But this is still an ongoing work. And yeah, I mean, we have this ambition and we'll see whether we're gonna meet it. For now, Tor is the best for web browsing because of the way it is designed with the circuits and so on. I understand. Thank you very much for the answer and for your talk. It was very interesting. Yeah, I like the idea of a smaller uh, mix network in the mix network, it's like faster. But... Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we will see where it will get us. Uh, hopefully we will be able to do something like that, but it's still um, lots of work to really consider for having web browsing over mix and it's a it's a complex thing yeah thank you cool 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 all right uh i think that's uh we'll close here with the but before letting you and Rissena go we'll ask you to commit to you know coming to ucl or around ucl at some point uh, when when it's safer and maybe the weather is nicer um, for for a drink uh, and this is the new office deal oh i think my internet just broke no you're still there i think and oh. internet broke oh oh is that okay so maybe i guess that's Sorry, a way to get out of the died. commitment <laughs> Yeah, exactly. No, I think, I, I hope you can hear me now, my internet just died in the moment when you were saying commitment. <laughs> <laughs> Convenient. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but no, of course, uh, I don't know what exactly was the commitment but, uh, about, but yeah. I'll oh, the commitment to is to UCL. come visit us at UCL when things improve and the weather improves and, you know, get a drink, get some food. Um, yeah, yeah, for come. sure. All right, <laughs> great. I'm Thank you so much for doing that. this and uh, good luck with, uh, with, with Neem and, and everything else and say hi to, to Harry and, and everybody else. I will, I will. I know that he wants to get in touch with you about something. So you oh, can okay. at some point expect an email from him. From sure. Yeah. <laughs> pleasure. All right, thanks everyone. Take care, have a, have a good evening. Thanks a lot. Thank you.